Go back just a little bit. I was in high school at Hopedale. I had finished three years of high school, but that summer's when I went to work driving truck and you could that. And I felt that I was doing something in my own way for the war effort. And of course, I got my mind off education and looked toward the military. So I went, came to Canton, Ohio and, and the fall of uh, uh, 1943. I went to work for the uh, Timken Roller Brake Company. Well, while I was in Canton, I felt a urge to do something more than I had done. So I'll never forget over in Canton, I went down, it was the post office that would have been in December of 1943. I saw the the Breed uh, recruiting station there, and I walked inside, and I told the, the man there, I think he was only a, I don't know, I think he was just a PFC, I think, or corporal, I'm not sure, but I remember, but he had his dress blues on, and I told him I wanted to enlist the Marine Corps, and he said, how old are you? I told him I, at the time, I was 17. He said, well, they said, we gotta have your birth certificate, and we gotta have one of your parents, or both your parents sign for you. Well, to make a long story short, when I was born in, down in uh, Minerville, Ohio, the doctor that delivered me never even recorded by birth. And so I had to go through the church baptismal records and the judge in the county there and school records. They finally got me a birth certificate. And I was, uh, my parents, my mother and dad had to sign for me because uh, I wanted to go because I said, well, I'll be 18, I'll be drafted. So I gave up a year in high school enlisted the Marine Corps, and then I was sworn in in uh, January of 1944. What was it about the Marines that decided, you know, made clear to say, I want to be a Marine? What, what was that deciding factor? Well, I can tell you there was two reasons for that, uh, Cody. Number one, I love that green uniform, the dress blues, and I thought, oh boy, that makes a sharp looking guy. Well, the long story is I never had a pair of dress blues. But the second thing was a Marine Corps hymn. And uh, I still to this day, when the, the hymn is played, there's just something inside of me that I was a Marine once, and they say once a Marine, always a Marine. And that just blesses my heart, the Marine Corps hymn. I want to stand and salute to whatever I hear. So those were the two things, the hymn and the dress blues where I was actually sworn in was in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, I went from Cleveland, I didn't know anything. I knew there was a, I heard of Paris Island, South Carolina was a Marine Corps boot camp. Well, I got on to, put me on the train there. There's several of us there and they, they, they got us together. We got on a train. And we spent about three or four days going up the West Coast, all through the South. And those cars, those days, no insulation. No, nothing. He just went along with the dust flying and everything. But we went out to West. We got into Los Angeles, and they picked us up on buses and took us down to San Diego. And uh, that's where we took our boot camp at, the Marine Corps Depot at San Diego, California. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was introduced to boot camp, and I'll tell you, that was a life-changing experience. In fact, they, they actually broke you down completely. And they started all over to make you over again. Uh, I'll never forget, we went down and they gave us clothes and they gave us a bucket to scrub rice and all the, I don't recall what all. And then they took us down to the get the barber shop. They're going to give us a haircut. I'll never, some of these guys had nice wavy hair. The barber say, well, how do you want that? And he say, well, just take, with the clippers. Man, there was hair on the floor that deep. But uh, <laughs> come out of there, you were skinheads. So that was the first thing to take you down. I'll never forget, we had a drill instructor. Uh, they were only PFCs, and he called us out. He was a pretty rich of reading, maybe been a, uh, a full-timer, I don't know. But he used to come out, I'll never forget the words he said. He said, you people, he called us people. He says, I want you to know that you are the lowest forms of life that ever lived on this earth. But he says, I'm gonna make Marines out of you. Well, they did, I'll tell you, they, we got up at 4.30 in the morning and I went through a boot camp there, a the close order drill, and, and we, we got reprimanded pretty hard. I remember one night, we, uh, somebody in the, in the uh, platoon, there was two, 361, San Diego, I got maybe a picture of that thing there of me. But uh, I don't know what this party done, but in those days, 
They tried to get you to tell on somebody, but nobody would ever tell on somebody because you'd get in one bad way, two ways. You get in bad because the fellow Marines would hold that against you, <clears throat> and if you didn't tell, you were in bad with the with the drill instructor. He told us one night, it was like, he said, load your sea bags. That was where we had all of our, we put all of our gear, all of our clothes, our extra shoes in there, and fell out, he says, in front of the hut. And he says, now, double time, and he took us down what we call the boondocks. It was kind of an area of sand. And he'd do the rear march, double time, forward march, left face. I mean, all through that, I actually saw there was two or three men that, that fell with charter horse, their leg, they couldn't go. But I mean, we come back, it was a tired, tired boy, I'll tell you. But uh, those are just one of the experiences. Well, I know the other thing, if you got dead, they'd make you scrub the floor of the hut with a toothbrush. You know, and, and if you were caught not shaving, they'd get you under the under your cot or your bed, and they'd give you a razor, and they'd take a doll and tell you to shave. I've seen guys actually bleed for that. Now, those things don't go on today, but they went on back there. And uh, so we went through it. We did a, a manual marching of arms and all that. And it, we'd slap our, our weapons with a strap underneath one ear and then slap. In other words, when you do the marching of your arms, you do it right port, left port. And uh, if you, he'd say, all right, I want you guys toughen them hands up. He said, I want you to beat the blacktop the pavement. And if you were coming down there and you were just pussy your foot, hit them a little bit, you had a foot on your hands. So you better really be fat and what the drill start to go back. And he'd go inspect that rifle. We had M1s. Well, you always brought them up. And then you'd put the clip down to open the receiver up. And then you'd hand them out. And he'd take them and turn them up down and look the barrel and everything to make sure that it's clean. And literally, he would throw that back at you and better be ready to catch it that was slamming. And from there we went to Camp Matthews, which was a rifle range to us all. I don't know how many miles, maybe 20 miles from where the depot was, San Diego. But uh, we lived in pyramid tents there. There was no, not even, there was grass on the floor. We had cots to sleep on. And uh, so we went to the rifle range and we went through firing, I think, just about all the weapons I can remember. Some of them I fired later on. But uh, I know we went on forced marches. They put us a night. You'd go out maybe six mile double time with full field pack, 70 pound on your back. And I'd say they, they had us tough enough. But uh, after all that experience, uh, I uh, never forget one day some of the guys in there, they got the uh, drill instructors packed and they put some rocks in them. Well, he got back, he found it. We paid for that. I can't remember what all we did, but he was mercy, wasn't, he was, had no mercy, he was merciless on it to do all the things he needed to do. What happened uh, if you called your rifle a gun? Uh, you know, what you stood up in front of the group, you say, this is my rifle, this is my gun, this is for work, this is for fun. <laughs> did you ever hear that expression? Yeah, I had to ask you that because I, you know, I read these memoirs and boy, if you called it a gun. <laughs> oh, no, that's, that's either your piece or your weapon. It's not your gun. He'd say, this is your gun. This is for work. This is for fun. So what, did anybody ever accidentally call it a gun at all that you can remember and what happened to those people? <laughs> I think there was a time or two. I know one thing, we stacked our rifles, there was a stack that swiveled up on the M1 right near the top, and you could put them up there and you could stack, you know, four rifles or six, whatever we had. <clears throat> if, by some chance, you rubbed in and knocked them over, you know what happened? You slept with those rifles that night in a cot. <laughs> yes. Wow. I, uh, I remember one time there was a guy in our platoon he, he wasn't the cleanest guy. He didn't like to take his bath because the water was cold. So you know what happened? The brother started to told him, took a bucket of water and one of them scrub brushes, it took him out in the shower and scrubbed him down. And that wasn't very nice. I think after that, he never missed a shower. <laughs> then after that, well, 
we went back to San Diego, and I'll never forget on the parade dress day that we were marching in front of all the officers, and uh, I'll never forget what that drill instructor come. He says, well, Ben, he says, you come in his boots, he says, I want to congratulate you. He says, you are now United States Marines. How'd that make you feel? Proud, proud. It was all worth it just to hear that name to be called United States Marines. So after that, I came home on furlough, and then I went back to Camp Pence. And there, I, the 5th Marine Division was forming, and so uh, I was in the 5th Marine Division. I trained, oh, we had all kinds of training. They trained us how to use flamethrowers and how to, we went to demolition school, how to use demolitions and uh, taught how to use the machine guns and what they had space setting and everything. They just gave us a lot of training. Mm -hmm. And uh, they want us to be familiar that whatever weapon you might have come in contact or whatever you might do, you were able to do it. Were those drill instructors, were they former uh, veterans or that had well, yes. shit bag? Oh, yeah, they, you can tell they were salts. We called them the salty salts. And when they were in the they have been there a while, but I don't know, I suppose later they got promotion, but uh, PFC Kilgore, I can't remember the other state. So they were formed, they were like- They stayed there in San Diego. And they, the new platoon come in, they take it. But the your, your drill instructors, their background, were they, were they, you know, former like, you know, Guadalcanal veterans or something like that, and they just brought them home to start training? You remember? That I don't know. I never had any, you did ask him questions. <laughs> all you would say, PFC Kilgore, corp or private scheme was to speak to the drill instructor. You say, what's on your mind? You tell him, well, he's, oh, you'll get love, all right. That was it. You took that final answer. It wasn't what you wanted, you still took it. But as far as their background, they had been in the Corps for a while because they knew, because they could call cadence and everything. And I mean, they could take you out of the parade ground, they'd say, to the rear box, right and left. And they could say, right oblique. They could have us going forward ways down the parade field. They'd call cadence. We'd come right back into a form. That was what you call close order drill. We went, every platoon went through that. Wow. So now, they had you sharp, sharp. Well, they, that's what they, they taught you to be obedient, to be as perfect as you could be in them. So that's, that's, that's why boot camp, I know I forget another experience I had. Some of these t tortures we were going through, this guy apparently called his congressman about a complaint. When they got back to the, to the DI and on probably his officer head, and the DA got up there and he says, I want to know the name of the SOB they called his congressman. Nobody answered. I can't remember what the penalty was, but I remember that. I don't know who the guy was, but boy, I'll bet he, he felt bad about that. If you come out of the mess hall, you took food, you better eat it. Not there was a guard there right at the garbage can. You stayed there to eat that, all that food. I'm sure you guys were hungry anyhow from burning all those calories. Well, they, they fed us good at boot camp. I, I mean, what I say good, they fed us nourishing food. I'll never forget one thing they had. They had milk to drink. Oh, I love milk. And I think all the, all the guys did. It was good for us to do it. Mm -hmm. So do you remember some of your, your uh, boot camp buddies um, that were there? Did you partner up with anybody? Did you have a, kind of like a running mate, if you will, that you, you kind of clung to? Or Well, uh, I could remember a couple of the names. No one I was ever close to, not until we got into the 5th Division, then we got fellows we became, because when you're boot camp, you don't get liberty. You stay right on the base. You don't see the outside world. You know that, don't you? Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget they had took us down and, and swimming pool. You had to swim the length of swimming pool back and forth. If you didn't swim, you took, went at night down there to swim. Do you learn to swim? Everybody learns to swim. So when you guys were at the, the firing range, 
Uh, was there was there certain um, classifications that you could uh, earn by your by your marksmanship? Yeah, there was three three categories. There was uh, uh, I'm trying to think. The first was expert, a dead sharpshooter, and then a marksman. You had to qualify at those. What well, we used our M1 uh, to fire. We were I think it, I don't know how many yards it was. It was all the way to the butts. We called them the butts where they had the the guys worked in they they had these yeah, I think it was a twenty inch bull light, a bullseye, and you had to fire but these uh, the guys worked the butts and when you'd fire I don't know how many rounds now, whether it was eight rounds or five rounds, I think it was eight, uh, they'd come up, they'd have a marker to show where your bullets hit. And if you missed it's harder, you got Maggie's drawers, a red flag. So, what did you qualify as? I qualified as a marksman. That's the, you said that's the very top? No. Or, no, I, I did. I tell you, I was kind of nervous that day, but I qualified up at what they wanted. And oh, okay. There was, a, there was some of a sharpshooter. Uh, you see, we, we had firing in different positions. We took prone, sitting, kneeling, I think, and standing. Mm -hmm. And then we fired so many rounds. And that was the M1. You see, we had to had to zero those rifles in. We go there was a thing on the site there. You go you go so many clicks for elevation. You go so many clicks for right or left. And you always every time you took a back, you better know remember what the clicks were because you broke your rifle in. You come back and you cleaned it. You had to start a over to revive it. I know sometimes we were taught how to. Use Kentucky windage. You ever hear that expression? I've heard of Kentucky windage. That's sometimes if the wind is blowing, you move her baby a little bit to the right or left to compensate for that. Because M1, well, the M1 was a pretty accurate, but in fact, it was gas operated. It would throw you off. The 1903 Springfield was a more accurate rifle. That that's why that's why I have heard that the the Springfield 03 was. But that sucker had a kick to it too. I think. The M1 kick, but nothing like the O3. The gas operator kind of broke some of the. Mm -hmm. But that that kick, that M1 kick. So you, when when you when you graduated, and you were officially a Marine, what were your expectations moving forward? Well, I did not want it because the the future was uncertain. We did, they never told us anything. Oh, they told me when they come back off furlough. I was reported at Camp Pendleton, that's at Oceanside, California. I don't know if you know anything about Camp Pendleton. It was the, what they called at that time the Margarita Ranch. It was, a, I forget how many thousand of acres it was given to the Marine Corps to develop uh, Camp Pendleton. Pendleton was a, I think he was a general in the, in the Marine Corps. And uh, it had artillery ranges, it had everything you want to know we, at that place way. We went there, we were, we taught how to throw hand grenades. Uh, we, I told you before, we were told how to make charges, like a, a shape charge if we wanted to blow into something. Or we used what they call primer cord. It's like a, a yellow rope, like you wrap it around. You could take that C2 and put on it. You put it around a tree or a bridge thing, and you set that primer cord, it would explode, I don't know how many thousand, million feet a second, and it would set off many charges. You could put, cut down trees with it. You could do anything. These shape charges, you made them, they were like a cone. And you set them on top of a pillow. They could blow through several inches of concrete. The imports of went down. And it, like I say, I can't remember that we never fired a 50 caliber machine gun. That was a water cooler. The, uh, the, the 30 caliber was an air cooler. It had a floating head in it. I'll never forget, we'd take those, I always carried a spare head mm -hmm. in combat, and because uh, firing them rapid fire, the bear would get hot and actually warm. And then you had another head, and you, I can't tell you now, but you put them in and you had so many notches of head space you had so, so that bomb would, bear would float. You always had it loaded four ball in one tracer. Four, four rounds, they called a ball, and then you had a tracer. And that tracer would go out and tell you where to shoot, but at long range, that tracer would curve off to the left. 
because they, I don't know where what it was inside to make it, you could see it very clearly. Did you get any leave when you graduated? Uh, I had a, a ten-day leave from boot camp. Then I reported back to Camp Pendleton to Ocean Side. So your 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 ten-day leave, what did you do? Well, I came home to. Uh, I lived in a little town down here called Oakdale. I told you about. Mm -hmm. How did you get from California back to Ohio? Trade, trade. That was that was the only transportation that trade. How much money did you guys uh, get per month? I don't know whether it was fifty dollars or fifty-one dollars. It was a rough. I don't. I think it was fifty, fifty dollars overseas. We got. I think a little more, maybe. Two dollars more, and then you got BFC. You got two dollars more. You got corporate. You got two dollars more than that, and then I don't recall what. what okay. Happened. But you were base pay was. They used to say, fifty dollars in a horse blanket. That was your monthly pay. <laughs> so, well, when you guys uh, got back into Ohio, uh, do you remember uh, who you visited and, and what you did when you're back here first? Well, days? I visited people I knew and my friends at school. A lot of the guys that had been drafted, which I did not want to be drafted. That's why I wanted to Marine Corps. But uh, I visited all, I don't think I, I really didn't have a girl at that time. But I think I met a couple of my newer friends, and, but nothing other than just, it was a very short time because we were only home about three days out of the whole time. Did you, did you visit with your parents at all? Oh yes, I stayed with them. In fact, my dad let me use his car. Okay. I, I go to uh, Steubenville was not too far. I went down there, and Caddis was another town that we was close by that I was familiar with. Okay. When when you saw your parents and you said goodbye to your parents, what was that memory like? Well, I don't forget that time. I boarded a train of Pennsylvania Railroad in Steubenville, Ohio. My parents took me down. I think it was already in the evening that I train or maybe died because it seemed like it was dark. But I never forget. I shook hands with my dad, and my mother grabbed me and hugged me. She cried. I told her, I said, well, You're right. I said, I And I know that she had a fear for me. Um, boy, casualties were very high that time. So I, that was it. That was kind of a, a very memorable experience I had. I could almost see them and feel them as my mother hugged me. She cried. There you are, you know, you, you give your parents a hug and you're hopping on the train. What's that feeling like? Well, in a way it was a sad time, a lonely time, but it wasn't very long to my mind got looking forward to what awaited me. But for a while, I think that night I was pretty sad. Did you have any kind of regrets on when you're on the train or you know, like what did I get myself into at all? I never once regretted, even at boot camp, all the meeting we took, I never once regretted that I ever signed. In fact, all through my experience, I never regretted being a brain. Well, I'll tell you what I thought was one of the, a good weapon, I never, I fired it, but I never carried it, was a BAR, Browning Automatic Rifle. Did you ever hear of a bar? Yes, sir. We had 20 round magazines. You could use them on single fire, you could use them on semi-automatic. They were a very accurate weapon, very accurate. And uh, they were a good, they were in between the rifle and the machine gun. I mean, they had the firepower. And I, I think that I look to that as probably one of the weapons that I had very much respect for. You know, there was always two men. One man carried the, the rifle, the other man carried the tripod and the, and the ammo. Because we had these, like, satchels. They had those, those clips for the, what's called, were about that long. It had, it had 20 rounds of 30-06 ammo in it. I had a lot of expectations because I had no idea where we were going or what we would be involved in. They told us when we left 
can't handle it. They drove us down to San Diego at Six Flies. They could something called the Deuce Line. We used to call it Six Fly. And they were ones with the canvas tops on them. And there we would load the ship at San Diego. So that's pretty much all of it. I don't forget, uh, I think if I remember, we went through the towns or places people would wave at us because they knew we were heading overseas. So during during this whole uh, you know, segment, did, were you writing home at all? Or oh yeah, I home? wrote home. Yeah, I, I wrote home pretty regularly because I told my mom. She said, oh, you write to me, and I did. I don't know that I wrote every day because I wasn't always in a position to write every day. Mm -hmm. But I wrote, I don't, I can't tell you now, but I wrote what I thought was pretty often, whatever I could find time to write. Uh, you know, back those days, <laughs> we didn't need stamps. You know what we do, put on there, free. Right up in the corner of the letter. We'd have our name and our outfit and address and then a letter but we'd write free on it. So in the military, so being in the military, you have to send stuff for free. Is that yeah, what it we was? Could, and then of course, uh, every letter we sent out had to go through, be checked. If you had something in that letter that was right, they'd take a razor blade, they'd cut that out. We got on to San Diego, it was on a uh, Liberty ship, which was a troop carrier. I'll never forget the name of that ship. It was a USS Duel. It was a new Liberty ship that I don't think had been out maybe one other time. But you know, the worst, that was my first experience being on the ocean. And I'll never forget the day that we sat and looked back at San Diego. We got out of the side there and the ship started moving. And the first thing that happened to me, I felt something very nauseating sick down my stomach. And I headed down to the, where our barracks were, our, our bunks were, really they were cots. And I laid there, I was sick, seasick for about two and a half days. But you know, after that time, my, I got up, we did not know where we were heading. They never told us, but they said one day we're coming into land. And it was the Big Island of Hawaii at the place, a town called Hilo, H-I-L-O. And uh, we pulled into the dock there and they unloaded us on that ship. We didn't have any quarters to stay in, so we slept in a park at night. We bivouacked there with our, our blanket rolls and our things. And I can't remember too much how they fed us. I think they were rice that they fed us. And uh, the next day, they got us aboard a little train. It was a narrow gauge. And uh, we got aboard that. We went all the way up the coast from uh, Hilo up to a little town called Hanukkah. And there we got off the train. We rode in open cars, a lot of beautiful scenery. Uh, sugarcane fields and waterfalls and coastline was very, very grudging. We got off at uh, Hanukkah and they took us up in six bites up to what we call Camp Tarawa. Now Camp Tarawa had got its name from the 2nd Marine Division, their uh, Battle of Camp Tarawa. They came there as a, a camp that they would refurbish themselves and ready for the next operation. So we went to Camp Tarawa. It was a, a, a tent camp and we had for our buildings like for our meals and things we had quads and huts so uh, we got there and they signed us to, to our tents and we began the, these training that they had for us and uh, I can remember a lot of things that took place we went on bivouacs and overnight marches and things and we were up in an area at, at uh, Campbell Wama, which is known as the Dust Bowl it's way up on top between Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea, which were two stroba peak bouts. So we had all kind of facilities to operate on. The artillery had their uh, gun range where they could fire their, their artillery shells and mortar shells. And we had aircrafts that come over and they would fly sometimes down in, uh, in our bivouac or our marches. But uh, one thing I remember about it uh, it got very cold at night up there. We were at some 4,000 feet above sea level. And uh, there was very little rain there. It rained, but nothing like Hilo. Uh, so our tent taps were pretty much uh, by themselves. We had one electric light bulb in them. 
and that was basically a size of you know, our cots in there. So we slept all the time on cots. We didn't even have mattresses. So we just slept on our blankets and that's it. But I remember one time, and this is an outstanding thing that uh, we had not been on the rifle range for some time. And uh, they got us one day and said, well, you got to requalify or retrain on your weapon. And you took out, we didn't have a kicker on weapons. They had range weapons. And I'll never forget, they gave me this one M1 and uh, I was to fire it at a target. I can't remember the distance, but anyhow, I loaded six rounds into the chamber and I didn't even pass my uh, sling. My belt was on my rifle. I just put it up and put it to my shoulder and I pulled the trigger and I thought the world had exploded. What had happened in that instant, that moment, all eight rounds went off. That butt came out of my shoulder, hit my jaw. I never had such a feeling all my life. I found out later the rifle, the rifle had been used so much that a sear had got wore in there and went from semi-automatic to full automatic. So I unloaded eight rounds at one time. So that was my highlight there in the rifle range. <laughs> We spent time in Hawaii. We had Liberty in Honolulu, and all the uh, big out of Hawaii, there was a, uh, the uh, uh, Kilauea volcano, which is an active volcano. It's been very active ever since. And this is where the lava flows down into the ocean. And you go down there and you see the steam come up from the ocean as the hot lava flows in there. Actually, it's enlarging the island, the island itself. And then we went down on the other side we go uh, on these organized get-togethers down to the beach where they'd take, take us down in six miles and we could swim and, and they had sandwiches fixed for us. So those were kind of recreational days. But I never forget that when we went to there to swim, there's always one guy set out at a point there with a devil rifle because I never saw any, but I heard the sharks could be around. So he was sitting out there with that. This was one of the worst experiences I had, I think, in the, in the time I was in the Marines. We left Hilo, and RF had took us over at an LSM. An LSM is a landing ship medium. They are a flock bottom thing, like a tub. We got, no more got out of the breakwater of Hilo. You know, man, I'll tell you, I've never been so sick in all my life. It's a good thing I didn't have ammo for the M1 at that time, or I would have probably shot myself. Even the crew got sick. I remember one time, I look over the side, you could almost reach over and touch the water. And on the other side, bottom low and bottom can't go out of sight, and then it dropped out. Even the crew got sick. Oh, I tell you, the, the head or the restroom was a mess with all the trash part in there. But then we went over, it was overnight, I think it took us, I can't remember how many hours to get to Pearl Harbor. And there we got into Pearl Harbor. I went board another Liberty ship there. And we spent quite a few days, I'm trying to think, that must have been, oh, I can't remember, it must have been a couple days after Christmas we got there. Uh, but we were there until, I think, probably near the end of, toward the end of January. We had, uh, we had gone out a couple of times. One time we went out, we had to go over the side of the ship on the landing deck. And, uh, go into get into these uh, boats which are LCI's landing craft entry. I'll never forget one time I got put in a duck and that's a, uh, a vehicle that was used to go on the water. It could run up on land also. We were going into shore into Maui for staging and uh, I was standing up in there and there was a radio man he had a long antenna on it and all at once this duck had a piece of coral and that's Stop that boat right now. And I went flying over and broke the antenna off the, off the radio unit. But uh, it didn't sink. There was another duck coming along, pulled us back. And uh, that was my experience, the only experience I ever had on a duck. And that was enough. But we dug in that night on Bowie, and it was a staging we had, preparing us for self for the actual island we were going to be invading, which we did not know at that time. So we went back, to, we were down at Pearl Harbor several times. I had several liberties on Pearl Harbor, and uh, we uh, were there. I remember at that time, the, you can look over to Battleship Row in the Arizona, 
a little bit of the superstructure, if I recall, was still up. They had to clean it off completely. But there was a lot of damage around Wheeler Field. They showed a lot of the damaged aircraft and things off to the side. See, it had only been, well, since 41, it had been 42, 43, a little over two years at, uh, since Pearl Harbor was. So anyhow, I Liberty and uh, in Honolulu, I remember the village of Honolulu, the tallest building was the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. It was four stories high. During the war, it was an R and R for troops that came back. None of those high rises that were 25, 35 stories high existed. Honolulu was a very low keyed place, not much going. There was not much as far as entertainment was concerned. Although I did attend one of the Waikiki Theater, which was a, a, one of the big theaters there. But I had experiences on uh, there, nothing really memorable, but uh, I enjoyed on my first trip. That was an all expense paid trip I had to play. I'll never forget the time that I was on duty. I went down into the hold of the ship we were on and to guard the ship. You know what was down in that hold? Barbed wire, rolls after rolls of barbed wire. I sat there for four hours and I guarded that barbed wire. It never moved in a thing. But the only thing I was worried about, that was actually below water line. And I thought, oh my goodness, if a torpedo hits, I'm gone right here. But uh, then I remember one night coming back in, I'd been on duty during the night, four hour watches, and I was coming off the forward well deck and down. We had some rough, rough water, and a wave came over the front of the, the focus of the ship and hit me, and I, I hung on to the railing, or I would have been forced overboard. But that shows you things that I apparently was meant to not to lose a tad, but they made me think today, and I realized, and oh my, we had some very terrible weather in the Pacific. Some wave, waves were probably over 30 feet high. And now you go to down the deck, or go up a deck, you could hardly get up. And then you get down, and once they take off, and you fly down. In fact, I fell one time down a series of steps going down because the ship went down, and it went down, and I went down. But uh, I never, the, the ship, the food was terrible. I remember a lot of experiences aboard the ship. We would go through the mess hall, the galley, they call it, and we stood up and ate our dinner. We had a tray we'd get. And you'd stand up, you'd lean against there, and you'd eat your tray. There'd be troops on this side, troops on the other side. I'll never forget the experience that, that I had this one day. It was very hot in the whole of the ship, and everyone was very warm. And I got my tray, and I was there eating. Another Marine across from me, he was sweating profusely. Now I saw this man take his bread, and he wiped his forehead with that sweat. And then he turned around and ate the bread. That's one experience I won't forget. I tell you, you see all kinds of things. I had another time I would tell you about. I was on guard duty and I come in, down in the hole. They had lights, red low lights. And you had low, you could see, but they weren't so that you could see outside. And our, our uh, bunks or beds, we had a ship that were side to side. And you, you'd have five up and then Cross from you had to be another side. And I'll never forget coming down this one night. This guy was laying in one bunk, and he had his, his foot out of the blanket. And this guy was hugging his foot for all his work. He was making love to that guy's foot. Uh, I thought I'd die laughing that night. But those are just rare experiences I had. And I remember uh, I made, tried to make buddies with the guys, sailors. This one guy, we'd barter with him to get a loaf of that hot bread out of the bakery. That was the best thing on board the ship. <laughs> but the other wise, the food was bad. But it was a busy time. I don't know, I spent from, I'm trying to think, it was after in December, aboard ship, I didn't get off the ship, and, uh, ship till February the 19th. I was on board ship for over a month and a half. Wow. I, if I recall, it was about 20 ships in a convoy. And you always had two DEs, destroyer escorts, runners, out around the perimeter, back and forth. They had ways that they could pick up subs. And these ships would go so many minutes and they turn so many degrees. And that's been a tough turn the other way. They called it zigzagging. And that was to make it almost impossible 
for a submarine to get locked in on your position, you know. But uh, at night, there's no smoking above, and the entrance where you went out, they had a red light, you know, over the head, inside. Mm -hmm. So you could kind of see when you stepped out. But it was uh, not visible to other ships. One thing we were instructed, you never fasten your helmet belt when you're going over the side. You know why? Um, catch. Break your neck. Break your neck. If you start over the side, those guys up there with Dave would watch and they, they never had to tell me, but I understand that they were observing what you were doing. Mm -hmm. And it was even harder to come back. <laughs> but that, that, I was able to go up there as a young boy and it was, it was, I understand now where all that training came into me. The exercise and the account settings and the marches we had get us tough enough. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the exact dates. We went out and still didn't know where it was going. We went over sailing. We went across the international date line. And we went up and the next time we stopped was between Saipan and Tinian. And uh, we stopped there. I think we were there about three days. I didn't realize why we were there, but they were waiting for segments of the invasion force to beat. They were coming from everywhere, I guess, Guam and everywhere. And I'll never forget one thing. In the morning, we were not very far from Saipan. You could see the whole, oh, maybe we were a couple, three mile, I don't know. But we were in both of them. But you know, this one morning, well, several mornings, this one morning that I was up on deck, I saw this roar, heard this roar of it, and these 29s would come down. What? 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 And they would drop off and they were heavily loaded. They, they were on the way to Japan to bomb. I know that at times it was like 200 and some, it would be 29s that went off. I remember them at night, uh, they used the lights, they were loading, loading stuff on the ships. But then we sailed and we got within, a, I think it was three days from there to, to Evo. They, they told us then we were going to a place called Iwo Jima. We didn't know where that was at. Mm -hmm. It was in, I think that they called it the Bodhi Islands. At least I, I get that somewhere. But the, you know what Iwo Jima means itself? It's a sulfur island? It's sulfur island. That's it. And uh, there was Iwo Jima, another was called Chichen Jima, but it wasn't big enough for any military force. And there was another, I can't remember the name of I was on either one there. So anyhow, I guess the air, they'd been air bombing it for days and days. And three days before the actual invasion, the battle wagons come in. They set up fire. They lobbed them 16 inches. It was nine inches in a hole. They were pounding them. And uh, that morning that we got there, I'll never forget, uh, I hear the noise, the bombing. And uh, that was going to be DD. We had already told him he was I, uh, I don't know if you know the Marine Corps. The day before the invasion, they give you a special breakfast. Steak and eggs. We had our steak and eggs that morning. I'll never forget the chaplain. We lined up when we were aboard the ship. The chaplain came down and he gave us communion. 